not. I, um, I saw on your website, Anat, that uh, you will soon be entertaining comments by the medical community. Um, might you, with Dr. Merzenich, uh, be publishing an evaluation of ABM uh, using scientific mythologies uh, with clinical trials, perhaps, to enhance its efficacy? Uh, well, uh, I hope so. <laughs> we, the, the research that the, we, are, we are engaged in, uh, we're going to be using my movement content uh, as, as the, well, th that will be what will be delivered. Um, a, the, I, I'm, I'm hoping to, to do, you know, more research, some of it on the work with children. And that way I know that uh, Mike will definitely be willing to advise and support, but that will not be directly with him as, unless he changes his mind. But, uh, and we'll see. I mean, I'm very interested in, per personally, uh, partly I think it's because I'm from Israel and because, uh, you know, be being involved with rehabilitation a bit and now, of course, many, many years, I have a, a, an incredible a desire or vision to change the way rehab is done based on the principles that, you know, Mike's research and other neuroscientists' research and my work, because so much of what's done, for instance, with people who've had stroke, a, one can predict the ceiling of accomplishment in the way that they're getting their rehabilitation. If you understand how the brain works, you know that they're driven into a very limited recovery. <coughs> But, but uh, uh, where to do, how to, and research will need to be involved, but nothing's very concrete yet. One of the problems that Anat has, of course, that in, a practitioner has in an area like this is that, first of all, every patient is idiosyncratic. No two are identical. And then what are, what are, uh, when you're a practitioner that are helping people, uh, what, do you, what do you do with the control population? Uh, you know, some kind of bullshit, I'm sorry, some kind of second <laughs> alternative treatment. I mean, you could imagine that you could do a, you could have a, um, a sort of a contest between your strategy and someone else's strategy. Uh, they're doing their best and you're doing the best. Maybe that would be the best way to think about doing that. Now, what we're, we're doing together is that we have a, a group of uh, two, in, two engineers in, uh, at the University of Georgia that have created a a sensor-loaded bodysuit. And basically, this is a Lycra gar garment that has nine-axis sensors in, in it. And uh, the reason that we, we've, we've uh, developed this strategy is because it can completely reconstruct movement in real time, very, very accurately. So you can do that with other strategies. You can sit in front of the camera. But the beautiful thing about a bodysuit is you do not have to be sitting in a camera. It deals with your th three-dimensional construction, reconstruction of all of your actions all of the time. You can wear it. You can use it in a therapy session. You can, you can record everything you do in movement through the rest of your day. And it is, provides us a way to quantify what's happening in movement and in movement in the training procedures and in the practices and to, to really reconstruct the progressions and recovery of movement capability. So from the point of view of documenting movement, I mean, I know there's more in a NATS practice than movement. It's not just movement. But from the point of view of documenting the recovery as it relates to mobility or movement or control of action. And the other thing about Anat's approach, which is absolutely neurologically appropriate and correct, is that the emphasis at, from Feldenkrais was on variability of movement. It's not of doing anything repetitively, and, uh, you know, a thousand times the same thing, right? That is a neurological rut. It's about doing things, uh, the same thing a thousand different ways. That's really what the brain wants. Right, so the the that's uh, it's it's just difficult to, has been difficult to quantify such a thing, right? So I'm just saying uh, I think this will happen, and I think be, to my mind it just makes so much more neurological sense her practices. And one of the really interesting things to me has been that an app from a very different path in life comes up with basically the same. If I had to write down a set of principles about what you should do to recover somebody that's impaired in the ways that, that uh, the people that she deals with, she has a pretty good set of principles from the point of view of my science. Now, I'd like to 
partially disagree with you. Absolutely, go for that. <laughs> you know, Jews love to argue. Yeah. <laughs> this is a cultural thing, right? Uh, the. She's probably going to be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I do love you. <laughs> so, um, so if if I if I look uh, at somebody who had a stroke, so the thing or some kind of head injury, but I just take a stroke, and and they they are able to be put in sitting or perhaps even try to put them between parallel bars and get them maybe on to try to walk or something like that. Uh, even though, and I totally agree, obviously agree with you that there's huge variability, not just in the injury, but it's the, even if the injury is identical, the impact of that injury will be very different on different people because they're different, very different one from the other. But the thing is that that the way the intervention isn't done guarantees driving in huge limitations very, very quickly. So, so there is an injury, uh, the arm gets spastic, leg gets spastic, person disoriented, it's very traumatizing, there's some cognitive disorientation, whatever is going on, right? And the person is then asked to do that which they have lost. They're asked to do what they cannot do and of, oftentimes what they could do before the stroke. So it's also devastating. It's emotionally devastating, <coughs> which also drives the, 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 so they try to do it and they get the outcome that they get. So let's say the person's trying to get to hold something and the arm does that. They try it a second time, by the third time they anticipate this outcome, by the, third, by, by the end of that week, this is it for that arm. That brain, even though it had a stroke, is a very powerful, changing brain, which is what Mike is talking about. So there are certain principles that can be applied, including variability, but one of the very, very first thing is you do not ask people to do what they can't or they have lost. You don't start there. And so people say, so how will they ever get to do it? Because if you don't ask them to do it, well, how did ever baby learn to use their arms before they knew how to use their arms? Those are the principles that we use. And when we do this, the, the sense of loss of control on the part of the therapist and allowing for variability, slowing down, reducing the force, making it very short. Uh, one of the things is they exhaust people. Mm -hmm. They do way too many hours. So it, re in my world, regresses the system even more. I've been now in some communication with Jill Balti Taylor, and and you know she talks about where she was given an instruction and it took her two days to be able to translate the verbal instruction into meaning, and then she did it. She was asked to shake a hand of the doctor. So when she did it, they said, oh, it must be random because two days have passed. You see, that's again the lack of willingness to be enthusiastic because we don't really know, let's say, but if you don't know, why don't say, you're doing what you, I asked you, you're amazing. How about being willing to tell the good story rather than the bad story? So there are a lot of things that can be done that we, I believe will totally change the trajectory if they're done in principle. You don't do those repetitive things. You, don't, you, you, you do short periods, you vary, you look what the person is interested in, on and on and on. Uh, uh, she didn't disagree with me. I was, I was waiting desperately for it, but I just want to say, I just, I just want to say something in, in, in addition. The same thing occurs, of course, in psychotherapy or in the psychological side. You know, it's one of the few areas of medicine where you, you basically treat the problem sort of as, as you face it. You know, it, it's, it's the buck up strategy or it's the change this strategy, damn it, in, in, in treatment. It's not looking to the cause. It's not looking to the origins of it. It's not looking to the underlying alternate strategies. It's basically confronting it and saying, get better, damn it. You have a bad, you're, 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 you feel low today? Buck it up a notch, right? It's basically addressing it on, a, on the, you could say the most superficial clinical level. You can't do this thing? Do it, damn it, right? 
It's not really facing up to the fundamental science, the, the, what the brain needs, basically, to correct itself. And this is, this is there needs to be a, a more complete translation of the science in terms in which you can really provide help that relates to real recoveries, which, which of course, always encompasses the underlying operations of the brain that, that are controlling the recovery or that enable it. So I think we're, the science and, and practices are gradually evolving in a way that they're becoming more and more complete in this respect. And this is, this is my way of saying that I agree with Annette. <laughs> so I'm a very agreeable guy, by the way. You are, actually. You. You're very sweet. <laughs> but the, the, if I may be enthusiastic about you. Oh, well, sure. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, uh, the thing which I left out, which is sort of a partial disagreement, in terms of research and the model for research, since we can't duplicate the same person and situation twice once we do an intervention, but there is a way to, to see when we shift how we, what we provide for the person. Let's say we had a stroke, and there is roughly, we always know that there is variability, but the kind of recovery that I've seen in my own right. practice is so off, outside the box of what can be predicted. And right. it stays a lot longer. The typical time that the person usually gets any kind of, and it becomes very tangential improvement, right? There's some improvement, and then it's going a little bit more, right. and then they release them. It's four to five weeks. Right. I would say maybe they wouldn't have to stay hospital, you know, in institutionalized and so on, but the recovery will continue a much longer time because what you do is you do the same process you write about your book, which right. is the soft wired, right? That it's, a, it, it's not a different process for somebody who had a stroke than somebody who didn't have a stroke. It's not different for a child who is missing half of their cerebellum than a child who is not missing half the cerebellum. The brain is still amazing. It's just when it's off its tracks far enough, it won't usually spontaneously or necessarily find back its path. But it's pretty easy to get it back on track. Done. <laughs> Your turn, I think. Dr. Merzenich. 